thanks for the opportunity to present this uh, work here. Uh, and I want to first acknowledge my colleague, Ali Reza Kermani, who did a good portion of this work. The topic is modeling flow of exhaled droplets between two runners. Now, simulation has always been key in, when it comes to predicting particle flow, whether in air or other domains. Uh, it, it's a very useful tool, but you can imagine it's more important these days because of the coronavirus pandemic and the simulation like the one you're going to see here. Now, the key to getting these simulations right is to capture the right physics, uh, which is airflow and the moisture in the air and the air temperature, and then also the particles, and the particles have different uh, forces acting on them, and they evaporate at different rates. Now, when it comes to the particles, there are uh, there's a wide range of particles. So let's say those that are really small, less than 20 microns, roughly, some disagreement there in literature, are aerosol particles. They stay um, airborne for a while. And uh, we treat them in uh, these models as massless particles. We still look at the forces acting on them, but they're massless. With larger particles, commonly called droplets in this application, we account for their mass and their inertia as well. And when you have all these things in place, you have a, an accurate CFD tool that will help you understand the spread of pathogens in whether two runners running outdoors like you see here, or uh, a plane, or a classroom, um, or uh, any other venue, it's the same physics. And also it'll help you with design of ventilation systems because airborne particles, say in restaurants, can uh, spread in a way that uh, can be very detrimental. So the example we picked here are two runners, six feet apart, running in tandem, no wind between them, uh, or no, no wind, <laughs> and they're running at uh, a moderate speed of uh, four miles an hour. And we picked that because we know this to be a relative, an unsafe distance in the case of running. And the simulation does show that it is indeed unsafe. And uh, I, I put this figure here, even though it's a spoiler, and it shows where the particles are going to land on the rear runner. Uh, the bigger particles are in blue, and you can see by their sizes, of course, exaggerated, that um, they will land on the legs. Smaller particles in lighter color and smaller size are going to land on the torso and the hands. Um, so clearly that's not a, a safe configuration to have. But before going into the interesting results, I want to do a little bit of intro about what we do here at Verist. We're an engineering consulting company focused on engineering through the fundamentals. We're COMSOL certified consultants. We do a lot of multi-physics modeling, but we also do a lot of non-simulation stuff. We have a lab for polymer mechanics, mechanical testing, chemical testing, and we have expertise in microfluidics, adhesives, additive manufacturing, and everything uh, on this list here. And one more slide about Verist. Uh, that we couple simulation with testing in a very good way. So for example, when it comes to uh, FA analysis of joints and interfaces, we do the chemical analysis. What you see is FTIR images on the left. You can see the chemical composition again in-house. Uh, then we do the testing, whether of the materials themselves to get their stress strain curves or the adhesive to get the adhesive strength. You get that data at different rates and different um, temperatures and you, you can then calibrate the material model, whether a cohesive zone model or a stress strain model. And then when you do the simulations uh, on the next column to the right, then they will be accurate simulations. And what you see here, uh, this is um, just a flexible wearable device and other examples. And the last column on the right is we actually also simulate the processes of making these adhesives, whether it's a laminar static mixer on the top or a curing of a different adhesive uh, down below. So getting back to the model, in this case, we. Uh, we develop the model in the framework of the runner. So the air is moving instead of the runner. And we solve it in an interesting way. We solve the steady state turbulent CFD problem first without the particles, but with the moisture and the temperature uh, um, solution as well. And then we take that as an initial condition to a time dependent analysis of particle tracing with all the forces and the particle sizes using the flow, pressure, temperature, and the turbulence data from the first study. This actually makes it quite fast and more likely to converge. And it's actually quite accurate for a wide range of conditions because this runs in a few hours. You can do a fully transient CFD with, um, with particles. And if it takes you days or weeks, then you can use it less frequently in optimization. Uh, so we try to find that good balance that can make this run in a few hours. And some results first for the flow. Uh, so these are the flow streamlines. Um, we uh, there's uh, recirculation going on behind the front runner, as you can see here, but also behind the rear runner. We just picked the uh, 
the particles that are um, uh, the, that highlight the circulation behind the rerunner. So then we do the particle tracing. We looked at the exhaled particles from the front runner. Uh, we assumed a 30% conical angle, like you see on the figure on the left, at a slightly higher velocity than the runner. Um, and they, uh, that, those numbers represent relatively deep uh, breathing, not coughing or sneezing or, or some other event. And the figure on the right shows how these um, uh, streamlines originating at the mouth do, and you can see they go right away behind the runner because of the, uh, of the running speed and other analyses you might have seen, they move forward further. And then we have to decide on what particle sizes to uh, include here. And there's a lot of literature. We picked one reliable source here, which gives the particle distribution for, a, I believe, a deep breathing, not a cough or a sneeze again, for, um, you know, based on particle diameter. And we, um, the, and there are many other variations. So that's that's why a lot of sensitivity analysis should be done on these simulations to see if, part, uh, if the particle distribution is different, how will that affect the findings? But we made some two other modifications between the input curve in blue and what we actually did in orange, which is to um, ignore for now aerosol particles, the small ones, that, uh, just because to reduce computational time. And the more general analysis we're doing, we include them, but not in this specific analysis. And also very large particles, above 200 microns, based on our, uh, our initial analysis, are going to fall to the ground right before reaching even the second runner at this speed. So we just ignored these two to again cut into the simulation time and have less data to deal with. And we account for the relevant forces on the particles, which is mainly the drag. And there are different models for drag and comp. So we use one that's based on the uh, drag coefficient uh, function of the relative Reynolds number, as you can see in the equations here. And one important feature of the drag, though, is that you have to add the turbulence effect. And turbulence creates a dispersion that uh, is a function or related to the turbulent energy and kinetic and, dissip and dissipation rate. And that creates a, a random walk that spreads the particle way more than it would have done in a laminar flow. And that actually is pre-coded in comps also straightforward to add. And uh, it, mis it slows down the analysis a little bit, but it is very important as you will see in one of the later slides. And, and we put also gravitational forces. And I was looking at the latest release of 5.6 and there are some new features that can make this analysis possible. You could always add any feature in COMSOL, but there are more pre-coded features for uh, droplets and um, even droplet breakup that um, I'm interested to look into uh, in the new release. Next important thing about the particles is their evaporation. Um, so that is a function of relative humidity, of the relative uh, speed between the particle and the air, and the particle diameter, and temperature if it's variable. Um, and COMSOL has the feature to put an accretion rate uh, we just have to find the right value. So we made it a function of these things I mentioned above. And um, then uh, that's important though, because as the particles shrink, the balance between drag and, uh, and gravity forces change, as you'll see in, in the next slide. So it's important to have that. And we limited the particle shrinking to a certain 20 micron size. In, in uh, the next round, we're probably limited to uh, the non-volatile component was like one and a half or two percent of the particles um, because once they get too small the solution takes longer um, but but you know it can be included easily um, up to uh, even massless particles we can include as well now how do you get that rate of evaporation though we did some models where we just put particles in air and you know flora goes around them and see how they shrink but um, the rates were of evaporation were too high. Uh, so we looked at the literature and we found there's a Wells evaporation falling curve, like which is what you see here, which is an interesting curve. It drops particles from two meters and finds how they will be terminated, uh, so to speak. And the particles less than a hundred micron diameter, uh, left part of that curve you see here, end up actually uh, evaporating to nearly completely um, small, uh, to a small size in before they reach the ground. Beyond the cusp, around 100 microns, you have bigger particles that they do evaporate, but they fall faster and they end up reaching the ground. So we scaled the, the, um, the curves that we had for evaporation to match that experimental data. And again, there's variability in experimental data and what constitutes completely evaporated. So the, again, room for improvement in all of these things. But that's a good way to, to, ca to calibrate uh, because particles do interact and uh, they're not in isolation. 
this uh, is an animation that uh, I think you'll like. It shows the particles coming out from the front runner and spreading uh, to the rear runner and beyond. The animation is colored by particle diameter and the particles are scaled up in size for visualization so you can see them clearer. And, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, and the figure on the right shows, the larger particles really hit the, uh, make it to the leg of the runner and the smaller particles uh, hit the face and torso. And you can see them getting smaller actually as they move uh, towards the runner and beyond. This is another view uh, from the top uh, to give you more perspective. And this kind of modeling is really um, sensitive, and we have to look at several sensitivity studies, which we're doing. But one of them that we uh, wanted to share with you here is the turbulent kinetic energy. It's important to get that right, not just the velocity of the air. And to, to illustrate that, here are two examples. On the left, no turbulence effect at all. And the right, 10 times exaggerated. And you know both are completely wrong because these are non-physical limits of the turbulence, but it shows that it it is the results are sensitive to that. So both make nice animations, but uh, not accurate. And a lot of calibration and validation is needed for this model. So in summary, we've, we've done this analysis, shows that two meters or six feet is really unsafe because a lot of particles hit the rear runner. And we can use it to evaluate other cases and find out chances of spreading or how to mitigate that. And um, certainly masks help. Uh, and then more validation is needed. Uh, but to some, this really was this was possible because we were able to add features uh, and to implement our own equations in COMSOL and modify the equations where we need to. Even if we need to go to more complex models where we uh, do a transient CFD or do a particle-to-particle -particle interaction and uh, and other complexities, it's doable. Uh, and what you get with that though is relatively inexpensive compared to other alternatives, fast turnaround time, and you get to see detailed local information, like like uh, where are the particles landing. Um, and so it reduces the need for testing, even though still a lot of testing and validation needed, but way less than if you don't uh, use simulations. And that uh, concludes my talk. I hope you found that information useful. Thank you.